April 16, 1988. A WBA welterweight title rematch as Mark Breland challenges Marlon Starling. Breland, a five-time Golden Gloves champion and Olympic gold medalist, is seeking revenge on the man who not only took his title, but handed him his first loss as a pro. Starling, the magic man, is looking to cast his spell on Breland and retain his title. It's a Las Vegas showdown for the welterweight championship, next on Classic Night at the Fights. Mark Breland, he was one of the greatest amateur fighters of all time. He was undefeated 20-0 and 0 as a pro. That was until eight months ago when Marlon Starling just ran right through him and floored him in the 11th round. Now, the rematch. Marlon Magic Man Starling, moochie to his friends back in Hartford, Connecticut. 28 years old, 43 wins, the WBA welterweight champion of the world, and to many, the most underrated fighter of this generation. Let's get the official introductions. The next bout of the evening, ladies and gentlemen, features 12 rounds of boxing for the WBA welterweight championship of the world. Introducing, in the blue corner, fighting out of Brooklyn, New York, weighing in at 146 pounds even, with a professional record of 20 wins, one defeat with 13 KOs, he was a gold medalist in the 23rd Olympiad in Los Angeles and a former WBA welterweight champion. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Mark Breland. And in the red corner, from Hartford, Connecticut, weighing 146 and one half pounds. His professional record consists of 43 wins, four defeats, 26 KOs. He is the WBA welterweight champion of the world, Marlon Magic Man Starling. Mills Lane, the referee for this 12 round title fight. I'm Joe Tessitore alongside the Iceman, John Scully. Ice, when you look at Breland and Starling face to face, you can't help but notice the physical advantages for Breland. He's six inches taller. But why did that physical advantage not show up in their first fight? Well, I mean, actually, I, I think it, it did show up in, in parts of the fight. But uh, Marlon was just so relentless that night. And uh, he showed the determination and desire and strength could overcome those physical disadvantages. He... Um, he actually took a lot of abuse in that fight. I've talked to Marlon several times about that, and he, uh, he, no matter what he says, he certainly has a great deal of respect for Mark's jab. He actually told me that Mark's jab is harder than most fighters' right hands. He said Quite he, a he statement. Had, he, he was very adamant in his praise of Mark's jab. So, you know, Mark broke his nose with the jab in the first fight. So Mucci outgutted him and, and, and nullified his, his advantages, nullified Mark's advantages, just by being so much more in the desire department. He was so focused. And um, one thing I look for, it's hard to have a moment like that twice in a row with a guy. You know, you, you reach that plateau. That's not an easy thing to do again, you know? And uh, leading up to that fight, he was a, an underdog. And Breland was, you know, 110 and one as an amateur, maybe the greatest amateur ever, gold medalist. He just didn't look like he was going to lose. And um, now for Marlon to be in the position of being the champion, maybe some of that edge has been dulled. You know, you never know. So that's something to look forward to, I think. Breland playing keep away with that distance and that long jab. As Starling tries to get to the inside, that guard up. There's a jab from Breland. Left hand from Mucci. Oh, and there's a good left hook from Starling. Yeah, he's stunned there. So Breland stunned early on here in this fight. Round number one, and Starling right back to work where he left off in the first fight. Remember, it was a left hook that floored Breland in the 11th round of their first meeting. And if you go back to the first fight, what I think really wore Mark down and set him up for that knockout was 
Marlon pushing and mauling and just manhandling him on the inside. So I'd be curious to see if Marlon could do that again and if Breland could stop him from doing it. Actually, Breland has actually taken, taken the initiative to push Marlon off, which may or may not be a good strategy. Starling now trying to get underneath that jab and back to the inside. He has scored the biggest punch of this first round, the left hook. Right hand from Starling. So Mucci off to a quick start here in the rematch. Breland tries to return fire. If there is one thing that Breland wants to do in this rematch is show Starling that he's a stronger fighter this time around. Big opening round for the world champ, Marlon Starling. View from the corner of Marlon Starling, the welterweight champion from Hartford, Connecticut. Connecticut's capital city that has such a long and distinguished fight history going all the way back to Fat Battalino and of course the great Willie Pep and now the new generation. The boxer puncher, the big heart of Marlon Starling. What a first round. He was telling everybody this week that he would come right at Breland all night long. He did so in round number one, scoring the big left hook that stunned Breland, and then the right hand over the top. Easy round to score for Starling early on here. Now he's got to be careful though. Mark, one thing about Mark as a pro and as an amateur, especially as an amateur, his right hand was like it had knockout drops in it. Like he would just hit guys, good fighters. He, he knocked out some of the best amateur fighters in the world. Um, Russians and Cubans and top Americans and he knocked them out with one shot just dropped them you know just with wicked right hands like a Tommy Hearns type of right hand and he definitely gets leverage on it Marlon you know can't be too overconfident and rush into that because Mark is still dangerous I don't care what what happens he's still Mark Breland he still got that jab right hand like there like he, he didn't land it but that's a good shot interesting the way that you phrased it he's still Mark Breland because the name Mark Breland carries so much weight and he has since his teenage years because this is perhaps one of the most hyped fighters of all time you could easily argue the greatest amateur fighter of all time Mark Breland staggered there with a clubbing right hand but five New York Golden Gloves the Olympic gold there have not been many fighters you can name that came into the pro ranks with more hype than Mark Breland Oh, without a doubt, I would say he's the most hyped because I can remember when Mark was an amateur well before the Olympics reading stories on him in People magazine. Now, you just don't see that. And when they focused, a lot of people don't remember this, but the great 1984 team, you had Pernell Whitaker and Melody Taylor and Evander Holyfield, but the star of that team was Mark Breedman. There's no disputing that. He was the star. Of course, so many members of that team have gone on to pro glory and Breland was well on his way up until he ran into Mucci Starling eight months ago that fight was in South Carolina here we are in Vegas tonight for the rematch and look at this Mills Lane is trying to break him up and they won't Well, they got the right man for the job in the veteran Mills Lane. But there is real, real bad blood between these two. Mark Breland and Marlon Starling. When did it all hang out on the Vegas night? And here comes Mucci working his way in. Counter right hand. They both missed their punches. They both missed every punch they threw. Actually, so um, that was that clubbing right hand when Breland was a little off balance. But now looking at a replay, it looked like it was to the back of the head. Right, right. They missed. They they both tried. Marlon tried to counter him. A good textbook movie tried to counter his right hand with his own, but he missed it. So round number three, scheduled for 12, WBA welterweight title fight. Marlon Starling, the champion in the red trunks. Mark Breland trying to avenge the only loss of his career. And I'll tell you something, just, uh, it could mean something, it may not, but just a little trivia. 
Mark's only loss in his entire life other than to Marlon was to Daryl Anthony in the 1981 Nationals. And as pros, they met again, and Mark destroyed Daryl Anthony in the third round. So in his one rematch up until now of a guy that beat him, he scored a knockout victory in the third round, I believe it was. That fight exactly two years ago this weekend, April 12th of 86. And you'd have to think Mark's, Mark's motivation was obviously high when he fought Anthony again, but you'd have to think he'd want to knock out Marlon Starlin even more than he did Daryl Anthony. Oh, there's no love loss here between these two, and Breland made the comment that this is by far the hardest he has ever trained for a fight. It needs to be, because there's no quitting Starlin. Right hand by Breland comes in. Starling right there to answer and gets himself to the inside before Breland brings it back to the center of the ring. Six inches taller is Mark Breland. But when Starling can get to the inside, Breland is unable to fully extend that phenomenal jab of his. One thing you see, Breland is standing up to the physical pressure much better. The first fight... You know, he claimed there was a, a problem with, it. I believe it was his cartilage and his rib, and it was obvious something was wrong. He just couldn't withstand the pushing and the shoving. It was almost as if he had his legs drained of energy. He would literally drop to the floor, I think, like 10 or 12 times in the fight. So far here, he's actually even at the end of that other round, he actually initiated fighting and pushing. So that's a good sign for him. Right hand by Starling. Breland back to the jab. Such an effective weapon with his frame and his skill. Right hand behind it. Starling double jab, and Mills Lane wants to tend to the loose tape on the right wrist of Mark Breland. Men utilizing the jab. Starling tries to get to the inside with the left hook again. End of three between Starling and Breland. Marlon Starling preparing himself for round number four. Mark Breland trying to fight this fight at range. Double jab early on here in this fourth round. Tried to place the right hand behind it. Marlon is definitely fighting with better technique than he did in the first fight. I mean, people kind of forget, like, he, he was very strong in the fight and, and physical, but his technique was probably, uh, even, even admittedly by himself, he says... That was probably the worst fight he ever fought as a pro in terms of how many times he got hit. He probably got hit more in that fight than in any 10 of his other fights combined. But here, he's picking his shots a lot better, and he's actually attempted the counter right hand about six times, and I think he's missed it all six times. But you keep throwing that enough times, you're going to find your range sooner or later. So I think the counter right hand is something to look for. So fundamentally, he's scoring well tonight in your eyes and doing the right things but maybe that rugged sloppiness and just muscling effect of that first fight was in a way the perfect game plan to defeat Breland. Mouthpiece comes out now. Well there's a way to beat guys and, and Mark does even though there's a difference between punching power and strength and, and Mark I think is a good puncher but I don't necessarily think he's a physically strong guy. I don't think he could battle Marlon for 12 rounds of pushing and shoving. But um, the problem with Marlon is that's not really his style. And even though he did very well with it, I don't think he's necessarily comfortable with that. Right. It was just the role that he had to play to accomplish the task at hand. Right. And a lot of that was motivation. And, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier. He might not feel that same desperation. Because if you remember, when he... Oh, good, good right shot. hand. Solid, solid right hand, and you can see Breland is holding on. That so Breland a... giving you the body language that clearly states he was affected by that right oh, hand. And now a oh. big left hook from Starling. 
So there have been two instances tonight where Starling has hurt Breland early in the first round and now here in round number four. See, Mark is reacting better to it, though, believe it or not, than in the first fight. I think in the first fight, those same shots, he would have fell down by now, whatever's wrong. So he's, he's got a little bit more uh, recovery in him, which is, which is a good sign. But you're not going to take shots like that for, you know, the entire 12 rounds. Those are good shots. And again, Marlon is landing better shots than he did in the first fight as, up to this point. The first five rounds, Marlon didn't land as many clean shots as he landed elbows and shoulders and, and made it a mauling fight. So the right hand and the left hook, the signature punches so far tonight from Marlon Starling, and they score well here in round four. Come on. Spit in here. Come on. Work the body more. When you get inside, work both hands of the body, and then shift to the head, okay? The combination's getting the moves. Come on. Okay. Like, you know how. Eddie Futch. And young New England blood and guts fighter himself, Freddie Roach, in the corner of the world champion, Marlon Starling. What did you make of the advice they gave him, Iceman? Oh, very good. The body, you know, like I always say, boxing isn't always brain surgery. And a guy like Breland, anybody in boxing with a little bit of knowledge could, could know. You have to go to his body. You have to rough him up. And, um, you know, you dig that body and slow him down, and then the headshots. See, Marlon is landing headshots from the outside. He's kind of winging them, and he's coming up lucky. But he could make that easier for himself later rounds, digging the body like that, and then come with better, crisper shots later in the fight to the top of the head. See, Breland just pushing him away so he can be at the end of that jab, which he is right now. Breland, four, five good jabs here in this fifth round and that's what marlon told me breland has a good jab a very hard jab and he as an amateur he did as a pro he does and he's digging it here pretty good but he um i'm surprised he's not doubling it up he's kind of doing it in a way to hold marlon out as opposed to punishing marlon and I, i'd like to see mark dig the jab let it let it go let it fly right now it's keeping starling off of him which is definitely necessary looking at the damage that was done by the left hook in both the first round and the fourth round. But, as you say, he could crank it up a notch and make it an offensive weapon. Right. Still, though, here in round five, the landscape has changed a bit as this fight now on the outside and a big advantage for Breland. Sure. Marlon on the outside is not the same fighter. He's, he's going to have to pick up his, his work rate. On the inside, Marlon gets an advantage not just with punches but with being physical and that's what carried the day in the first fight so if Mar if mark chooses to box and stick that jab really a uh, streamlined jab he could make it very difficult for marlon marlon is a counter puncher by nature and he wants to stay on the outside marlon mark is so tall that he could make that very hard for marlon to do That was a good right hand to the body. He needs more of that. He's got to sink those shots in there every chance he gets. Because Mark is starting to get up on his toes. That, that certainly benefits him. Marlon is going to have to take every chance. It's obvious that Mark is not going to give Marlon every possible opportunity to dig on his body. So when Marlon gets the chance, he really needs to let those shots go. Much better round for the former world champ against the current world champ. Coming to the end of round five in Vegas. Okay, but when you throw punches, man, let those things go. Don't throw one punch, throw two or three. Just don't stand in front of them. Rock, his left eye is closing, and you haven't done any this one yet. You gotta get busy. Okay. All right, come on. Pick it up. Come on. Duva and Fariello in the corner of Mark Breland. They want to see the work rate increase here at the Las Vegas Hilton. The rematch for the WBA welterweight title. Alongside the Iceman, John Scully, I'm Joe Tessitore.
Darwin. Welterweight champion of the world in the red trunks. Gets up six inches to Mark Breland. Breland in that fifth round utilized the jab very well. Kept Starling off of him. Starling quick to go to the inside here in round number six. This has developed into a very heated rivalry in the course of the last eight months. It was last summer, August 22nd of 87, when Starling scored an 11th round TKO victory to take this WBA title. Comes over the top with a right hand against the bigger Breland. Now Mark does a lot of pushing on the inside. He pushes Marlon off. Now, one thing, he just did it again there. One thing, I mean, I think he's doing it to get range. He's trying to line himself up. It, it could also be a kind of thing where he's sending him a message because everything goes back to the last fight, and Marlon was by far the stronger guy. Mark might be trying to show Marlon, hey, I'm just as strong as you, and he's trying to push him back and show him that strength. So that's something to look forward to, but also... It could be a thing where it wears him down. You know, pushing in the ring is a difficult thing to do. And, um, you know, you've got a guy that's 147 pounds. He might be 155 by now. And you're pushing a 155-pound man constantly. That could wear you down. But um, right now, Mark, when he gets his distance, that's, that's where he wants to be. He looks good from a distance. Breland jab right hand, but Starling covered up well. Comes in left hook, and then the right hand. Breland tying up on the inside. That's where Starling has had his success tonight. And I think Mark is very conscious of that. He wants to hold Marlon. As soon as Marlon gets in there, he like, like there, he grabs him. As soon as he gets there, he doesn't want a repeat of last time where he gets manhandled and bullied. But That's really what happened in the first fight. Oh, exactly. It was manhandled. Exactly. By the end of the fight, it was like a rag doll being thrown around the ring. Right. When he, when he finally fell, it was a great left hook. But when he was on the ground, I honestly believe fatigue played as much of a factor in as, as not him not getting up as anything. And that's the tone that Starling set. Halfway point of this welterweight title fight. Six rounds in the books. You gotta believe your you arm down. This guy's more tired than you are. Right now he is. Damn me, his left eye is falling. Come on, watch what you're doing. Las Vegas Hilton, home to the rematch. You heard Mark Breland getting a heavy dose of targeting that left eye of Marlon Starling. It is starting to swell. We start round number seven. Do you buy into what Breland is being told about the fact that Starling is more tired than he is? Well, it's, it's funny you say that because I was thinking of that as they were saying it, and um, the corner is a very, uh, uh, it's like a doctor's office, a psychiatrist's office, and that's where you want to hear something good from the corner. You want that. You you hope your opponent is tired. Having your uh, trainers tell you that is a huge boost. Even if you're not sure of it, having them tell you that is a big boost. So I think more than anything, they may not necessarily believe that wholeheartedly, but they're telling Mark that to keep Mark's confidence level up. Like they certainly can't say, "Hey, your opponent looks great. You know, he's full Understood. of energy." You know what I mean? So you have to you have to look for anything that the fighter can grasp onto to keep going. I get the impression, I get the feeling Mark is a, still a little bit tentative from the first fight. I think he wants to do more, but it probably deep, deep, deep in his mind, he's wondering if he'll get worn down again, which is natural. That's a natural reaction to, um, to what happened last time. You're fighting the same guy that did that to you, so you have those questions. And, um, you know, I'd like to see him assert himself a little bit more because he does have the power. I mean, Mark is a good puncher with the right hand. He's got that good jab, obviously. 
So, I mean, I'd like to see him establish himself more because Marlon is only going to get more confident if Mark continues to show signs of apprehension. And Starling doesn't lack for confidence to begin with. Oh, not at all. Marlon is a, is a fighter. He's a, he's a very tough guy. He's no nonsense in the ring. And he, um, you know, now as a champion, he's, his confidence is sky high. He's waited for this his entire life. And um, so he doesn't want to lose this position. And um, so I'd like to see uh, uh, Mark stand his ground a little bit more. Give Marlon something to think about, or else you're just going to let the guy run right over you. I know you've spent a lot of time with Moochie, Marlon Starling. Why is it, and what effect does it have on him that through these years and all the glory he's had, he's been so disrespected in a way, such an underrated fighter with the mainstream sports fans? Well, because he... Um, he didn't have the gold medal. He kind of likens himself to a Marvin Hagler. He's not flashy. He doesn't have the, the model looks to him. He, um, you know, he's not, you know, super slick in the ring. He's a workman-like blue-collar type of fighter. He's not a guy, you, you could say, hey, this guy is very good, but he's not a superstar. How affected is he by that? I think, very, I think that's what motivates him. That's what brought him to victory. I believe if you could point to one single thing, it was that that brought him to victory over Breland the first time. And it has him in good position here at the end of seven rounds. Starling out in front. WBA welterweight title up for grabs here in Vegas. The rematch between Marlon Starling in the red trunks and Mark Breland, the six foot two welterweight sensation who is trying to avenge the only loss of his career when Starling took the title away from him last summer by way of 11th round TKO. Round eight, I'm Joe Tessitore alongside John Scully. Double jab, right hand to the body for Breland. Would you agree that Breland needs to pick up the pace here, Ice? Definitely. Like I said last round, I think he needs to assert himself a little bit more. He's fighting. He's not fighting a bad fight necessarily, but I just think he needs to establish himself. I don't feel like he's done that up to this point. And Marlon maybe hasn't really either, but Marlon is certainly trying to. And he, he appears to be trying to. And I think that's why at this point he probably has the upper hand. It's almost like both of them are waiting for the other one to really open up and, you know, to start the race. And, um, you know, on the inside, Marlon is doing well on the inside, but he doesn't have that same, you know, zip to him that he did the last time. And to kind of to touch on what we finished up the last round with, I think Mark represented in the first fight everything that Marlon thinks held him back. You know, the, the gold medal and the, and the big-time promoter behind him and all those things. Starling now just covering up. He has the earmuffs on, leaning against the ropes, his own version of the rope-a-dope, and Breland almost questioning it for a moment. What should I do? And now Starling pushing back under the chin, and he stays there. Doesn't come off the ropes. Breland trying to pick his spots, attempting to split the guard, doesn't want to get suckered into something, but Starling not returning fire yet. What do you make of this, Ice? Honestly, I think Mark is mesmerized because Marlon has a great defense. I mean, don't let him fool you. That Those hands up, that's a beautiful thing he does there. He's very hard to hit solidly. And he's showing Mark, he's, he's taunting Mark here physically. And I think Mark doesn't want to waste his energy. I think Mark Marlon knows that. He knows Mark won't uh, you know, go all out he doesn't want to burn himself out so, so a Marlon, little psychological warfare definitely, for definitely. a moment here in this eighth round and you know what marlon got himself a nice 30 second rest there and now starling turns the tables and he's on the attack big right hand from starling what a strange eighth round it has been Starling lands the biggest punches, but also took a minute of covering up against the ropes. Take a couple deep breaths. Back all the way. All the marbles in panel. Here we go. 
there's the swelling around the left eye of Marlon Starling. Round number nine, four to go here with the WBA welterweight title on the line. Now Mark is going for the title now. He's not defending it, he's going for it. So these last four rounds are crucial. He's got to establish himself. And I think that sequence against the ropes in the last round epitomized the whole fight for him. He had an opportunity to pile up points and Marlon lulled him to sleep. He, he made it so Mark didn't want to, he was unsure of himself. It was very obvious that Mark was unsure of himself. He thought Marlon was, was suckering him in. And I think that, that tells the story of the fight right there. Because you can guarantee if, if Mark went against the ropes like that, Marlon would have been all over him. Different disposition. And Starling has proved that that mindset has brought him success against Mark Breland. As now they are 20 rounds deep into their two fights here in the course of eight months. Starlin on the inside. Breland needs to get back to that active jab when he's at this range. His corner has been pleading with him to work more throughout the fight, to let the hands go. He's got that pawing, flicking type of jab. He's, he has to get some of his back leg into it. He's got to pump it. He has to hit Marlon with it where Marlon has flashbacks to the first fight. Because right now, I think Marlon is more worried about the right hand that might be coming behind the jab than anything. I think that's the only thing that's really holding him back from rushing Mark. There's the jab from Breland. Three punch combination that time. When Breland does let that jab go at full force, you realize what an effective weapon it can be, and I'm sure that's what's frustrating if you're in his corner of knowing what he possesses, but not always seeing it. Oh, for sure. He's a, he's a man with a, with a full toolbox, but he's just, um, in this fight, he's fighting a very basic fight. He's not fighting like the Mark Breland that everybody knows, and that's got to be frustrating because he's in with a guy who people forget was he was way ahead of on the scorecards last time. Maybe the leftover remnants from that 11th round TKO being cautious against the champ. End of nine. Here we go. Seconds out. Marlon Starling out. started his pro career back in Hartford, Connecticut, Seconds his hometown in July of 79. Here he is nine years later, nine minutes away from potentially retaining his world championship. Tenth round against the very capable and always very dangerous Mark Breland in the black trunks. Breland circling, jabbing. Effectively boxing. Jab of his own is Starling. Now that was a good move there by Mark, where he jabbed to the body. He should, he should definitely be doing that more, slowing Marlon down, because when you jab to the body, it forces your opponent even slightly just to move forward, and that could line him up for Mark's right hand. So I'd like to see Mark do that more. Mills Lane is going to deal with the tape on the left hand of Breland. Twenty-four years old, five-time New York Golden Gloves champ, Olympic gold medalist, but that one loss on the record of Mark Breland. That's what's been bothering him for eight months. Can he do enough in these last three rounds to avenge it against the veteran Marlon Starling? 
And a big factor in this fight, I don't think Mark has landed his best right hand yet, but he's landed a few solid right hands on Marlon, and Marlon shows no effect. And that, uh, you know, that could have a big effect on Mark psychologically because Mark is used to hitting guys with that right hand in, in Tommy Hearns fashion, and they just drop. So he's in with a rough and tough, rugged guy who beat him last time and who walked through fire to do it. Yeah, so, as you um, said very well, if you were to pinpoint one thing and say this is the trait and characteristic and the difference in their first fight, it was basically the refuse-to-lose attitude of Starlin. Right, right, exactly. I mean, that was what carried him because he took abuse in that fight. I mean, I know for a fact his nose was broken, and um, he, like I tell you, he, he told me himself that Mark's jab was like other people's right hands, and he included that with sparring with Tommy Hearns and Virgil Hill and guys like that. He said Mark's jab was harder than theirs was. Freeland ducks under, missed with the right hand. Mills Lane has had himself a busy night. There was a point in this fight where both fighters refused to break. They were fighting over Mills Lane as he was in between them. Starling back to the inside. See if they can free up that right hand. Lane has to separate them. Championship rounds coming. Just around, just stop in them before. Okay. You got, you got to keep the pressure on. Work the ball. Yeah. That's how close you are, baby. Come on, you're not close to winning this. Come on now. Hey, Take them out, get man. those combinations going, baby. Come on. You hit him with the right hand. You hurt him. Come on, do it again. Come on, now. Come on do it again. Come on, baby. Go. Come on, let's Come go. On. Now. Come on. There we go. Ludo was telling Mark Breland, you're so close to winning this. Meanwhile, Eddie Futch. Reminding Marlon Starling, it's the 11th round. This is the round you stopped him the first time. All right, all right, all right. And I thought it was kind of um, interesting that Marlon asked Eddie Futch, he said, I'm winning in a question form, like he didn't know. And, it, and it's funny because I think most people would think that he is winning watching it, but when you're in there, you, don't, you just don't know. Some of the middle and later rounds have been tough to judge, tough right. to score. I will say this. The rounds that Marlon Starling has won, he has clearly won. Exactly. The first and fourth round, Mark Breland was flat out hurt. Right. Stunned and staggered back a couple times with right hands and left hooks. Yes, there were some nondescript rounds that could go either way. But if you're to look at the ledger and say these are solid rounds for one fighter, Starling has those rounds on his side of the piece of paper. For sure, and that's what that's what's memorable. You know, if I win a round and clobber you with 16 different type of punches, and then the next round you edge me by boxing me in a, in a nondescript round, even though it's one round to one, everybody's going to remember my round. So, and I think that's the story of this fight. Now here, Starling is showboating, lowers his guard, makes a face at Breland, and takes five or six steps back, reminiscent of what he was doing a couple of rounds ago when he rope-a-doped him, and Breland didn't know what to do. And, and Mark was, was too hesitant. Mark is showing, in my opinion, a little bit too much respect. If, if Marlon did that with the welterweight Tommy Hearns, I don't think that would happen. I think Tommy would step in and, and, and get a little angry, a little excited, and let his right hand go with conviction. And that's something that, that's missing from Mark in this fight that could make things different. He could get respect by doing that. Breland has been scoring in this 11th round. Right hand from Starling. When Mark lets his hands go, he's a very fluid combination puncher. He does nice things in there. He just, um, you know, he needs to do it more, obviously. Sweeping right hand from Breland. That's a very inviting target, that swollen left eye of Mucci. Left hook from Starling, trying to chase Breland down. Breland cupping that right hand behind the head. Now he separates and goes with a one-two of his own. 
And that's the Starling kind of returns fire. That's what you've got to show. You've got to show that kind of desire. And I think a good move, Mark could throw his jab out here and let it head hang there for a minute to blind Marlon and let the right hand come. Marlon wouldn't see it coming if he, if he did that. Starling and Breland, one round to go for the title. Twelfth and final round underway. Marlon Starling and Mark Breland. What a pace being set early on here. You can see urgency by Mark Breland. He gave away many early rounds. He was stunned and hurt in round one and four, but he has boxed better as the fight has gone on. Remember, he never saw the 12th round of their first meeting. That's when Moochie Starling earned a TKO win, had a huge left hook in the 11th round to win the WBA welterweight title. Now, Mark's done very well up to this point of the round. His whole thing is he's going to have to hold off a late surge by Marlon. I'm sure Marlon is going to want to finish strong in this round. I think there's, there's a pattern that's always kind of set with these two type of styles. Breland will always start out trying to establish himself. A guy like Marlon will let him do that for a while until, he, until Mark settles, and then Mark, Marlon will try and push to finish the round strong. I think you bring up a really good point because when these two styles meet, basically what it comes down to is whose kind of fight will it be? Who will allow the other one to set the tone of the fight? Right, exactly. And, and have the fight on their terms. Exactly. There's a way that each of these guys can beat each other. So one of them has to implement that plan. And uh, they've both shown capabilities of doing that. Mark has boxed very well at times in this fight. He's really nullified Marlon. And then, when, he, like I say, when he settles, Marlon comes back like gangbusters and, and makes some of these rounds hard to score because Mark does a lot, a lot of good things, and then Marlon finishes strong. Look at Al Breland. Through a five-punch combination before they tied up. Pushes Starling back into the corner. That right hand is free. You can see Breland actually working underneath. I mean, really, I think this is he should have done that earlier. This is the 12th round of a very close fight. One I think Marlon is probably done better in as a whole so I think Mark needs to dig down and land some good head shots to draw the attention of the judges I thought Starling would have tried to accomplish more in that 12th round Breland really nullified him he utilized the jab and then tied up a lot and matched him going to the body on the inside so perhaps Breland finishes up a little stronger, but no doubt about it that Starling controlled the first half of this fight and had the more significant punches when the power punches were landed. Right, I think anybody, if they didn't judge the fight round by round, but it ended and you asked them who did better overall, I think Marlon did better overall, landed the better punches. Quite a difference compared to the first time they met eight months ago when Starling just manhandled Breeling, mauled him, out-muscled him, just made a fight of it, and ended up wearing him down in the 11th round thanks to a huge left hook and scored the TKO. If Marlon Starling, and you see the swelling around the left eye, it actually became significant as the fight went on, could have changed any one thing in this fight, what do you think he would have changed, John? I think on the inside, he would have tried to give himself a little bit more room to rip devastating body punches, slow Mark down, because Mark moved very well at times in the fight. And um, I think Marlon probably wishes he could have mauled him and worn him down a little bit quicker. And on the other side for Breland, what do you think he regrets? I think if he watches the tape, he'll wish he pumped his jab with more conviction. Marlon was coming to him the whole night. 
and Mark has an excellent jab, and he kind of played like a keep-away type of jab as opposed to a drilling type of jab. It's going to be interesting to see how the judges scored the second half of this fight here at the Las Vegas Hilton. Let's send it up to the ring for the decision for this welterweight title fight. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the decision of the judges. Judge Jerry Ross scores Starling, 116, Breland, 113. <laughs> Judge Dave Moretti scores Breland, 115, Starling, 114. <laughs> Judge Elias Quintana scores Starling, 114, Breland, 114. The decision is a draw. A draw. Bottom line is Marlon Starling retains his welterweight champion. The crowd here believes Starling won this fight. You heard them applauding on the 116-113 for Mucci and then booing the 115-114 for Breland. Marlon Starling is still the WBA welterweight champion of the world. For John Scully, I'm Joe Tessitore. Thanks for being with us.